hurry up. It's almost time. I'm trying, but my snack won't settle down. Settle down? What are you eating? Caterpillars. Find them in the marshy bit of the bio swamp. Don't touch. Don't worry. I wasn't going to ask you to share. Ugh. But they're rather cute. Yeah, well, they sting like the dickens, so you might want to pull that paw back. Are you sure you should be eating those? It looks like some sort of mutation of the Acaria stimulea. Or the common saddleback. They are venomous. And delicious. And also mildly hallucinogenic, I think. He ate one while we were harvesting them in the swamp and was convinced he was a unicorn for about eight minutes. <laughs> oh, robotic creatures do not frolic well. So, how venomous would you say they are, Dr. Theo? On a scale of ouch to undetectable, but looks like a heart attack. Hello, am I too late? Ooh, what is the strappy horse fellow eating? Are they anything like Le Escargot? How do you say, um, uh, uh, snails? Totally! Grab a handful! Shut up, it's starting! The Oz 8000 Biosphere, portrait of a refuge. Refuge? More like refuse, I say. No matter where you live it, life can be extremely stressful. And while most people can escape the stress of their day-to-day -day lives by walking out the door to attend an evening at the opera or ballet, or simply stroll through their gardens, those who walk out the door of a spaceship will be instantly sucked into the vacuum of space, suffocated and frozen. Not very relaxing. Opera or ballet? What most people is he talking about? Members of the Narrators Guild are so overpaid. We're really not. In order to provide the residents of these long-haul, multi-year journeys a place to refresh body, mind, and spirit, the creators of the Oz 8000 model ships included vast, domed structures commonly known as biospheres. In 399 of the 400 Oz ships, according to Gated Galaxies, the biospheres are a delicately calibrated ecosystem, containing just the right balance of flora and fauna to provide the ship with a rich supply of oxygen. And in the adjacent greenhouses, sophisticated hydroponic systems grow fresh fruits and vegetables to please the palate of anyone who happens to be awake. Do we have greenhouses? Uh, more sort of grey houses, really. Do we have a snail house? Well, the bio swamp is full of leeches. Do those count? I thought you couldn't see from in there. How do you know that? Have you ever heard a crone zebra scream? I forgot I was a robot. Imagine being thousands or millions of light years from Earth and sitting down to a bowl filled with brightly colored carrots, lettuce, radishes, tomatoes, broccoli, and celery, seasoned with olive oil pressed from your own tiny grove of olive trees. Or in our case, a bowl of jalapeno caterpillars. And swamp bread with kudzu jam. Something amiss with the swamp bread, Dr. Theo? Not at all. And again, I appreciate you baking so many loaves in the shape of my initials. But there's really more here than we can eat before it goes bad. Badder. I beg your pardon? No offense to your creativity and skills, miss, but uh, nothing saves bread that's made from swamp stuff. Sheltered by thick, ionized, tempered glass to protect the fragile life within from the ravages of space, these spheres must have been glorious. Every earthly ecosystem had a sort of mini-me in space. Tropical rainforest, grassland, tundra, chaparral, even desert, all found a home on these flying arcs. Oh, that's pretty. Too bad you can't see these artist renderings, Julie. Oh, well, I'm watching it down here, actually. I'm sitting in a tree just outside the entertainment room, and they've got it playing on the mega screen. I'm pretty sure Tiberius thinks he's in an episode of Mystery Science Theater 44,000. Sadly, we must assume all those magnificent spheres perished, as, one by one, the Oz ships failed under mysterious circumstances. 
entirely caused by their onboard crews or natural disaster wholly unrelated to Gated Galaxies or its subsidiaries, officers, or agents. G2 accepts no responsibility or liability for loss of liberty, limb, or life due to incorrect use of machinery, gross negligence, intentional or reckless misconduct. By simply existing, you acknowledge that life is inherently dangerous and often fatal and absolve Gated Galaxies of any and all injury you may incur whilst voluntarily engaging in the hazardous activity known as living. So faulty parts, no user manuals, and a giant bomb on board can't be held against him. Is that what we're saying? Oh, crappy captains. Oi, speaking of, where's ours? What did I miss? Ugh, what is that smell? You're going to have to narrow that down. There's a lot of candidates in here. We were able to contact the Oz-13, which some people know as the Oz that never left the ground. When the tower failed to fall away, the ship simply sat and burned on the launching pad. Derelict and destroyed, the ship was thought to be abandoned until it was discovered that two men had moved in and claimed squatters' rights. It's pretty great, actually. Once we've cleaned out all the pods anyway, we got tons of room. We mostly live in the biosphere. It wasn't too damaged by the fire. I like the meadow. Raymond prefers the forest. What do you eat? And where are your pants? I don't really like pants. Yeah, it's really better not to ask him about pants. Right now we're living off of the ship stores. Mostly campfire food like beans and s'mores. I figure once those are gone, the gardens and the greenhouses will give us plenty to live on. But no pants. Don't ask about the pants. Pants are evil. No. Pants. While most of the Oz ships have met an untimely fate, one rather unique Oz ship remains. Of the 400 ships launched, only one had a more experimental biosphere. This is the story of that ship. This is the story of the Oz-9. What do you think of me now, Ma? One bloody documentary they give me, and what's it on? Yep. Oh, I am certain he has said that before. How would you know you weren't here? In place of the more standard biosphere, the Oz 9 was outfitted instead with a bio swamp, complete with brackish water, marshes, bogs, mangroves, kudzu, and just about everything you'd find in an estuarine environment, the Oz-9's bioswamp teems with life. Are mosquitoes really life? No, if they land on me, they're not. How similar are leeches and snails? If you're hungry, you can have my sandwich. What is in it? No idea. I've come to the conclusion that if I ask, I'll starve. How do they know we're still up here? We haven't had contact with G2 in ages. How do we know the Oz-9 still exists, while all the others are just frozen, silent space debris? Well, that's just spooky. It's like he's watching us. I am, of course. Ugh, don't even say that. Creepy. Fortunately, the cameras in the Oz-9's bioswamp have continued sending pictures back to G2HQ. What? what? Cameras? cameras? There's cameras, cameras in the bioswamp? Yeah. What? God, was I ever picking my nose in there? Wait a minute. Yeah. Did he say cameras? Seriously, did none of you pay attention during the onboard meeting? Onboard meeting? Yes. The one you were supposed to be running, Captain. Oh, Monsieur Snooty Pants is going to be so happy. The whole entire world has seen him fly into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Where are Colin and Lee, anyway? Hold up in an empty pod bay working on Colin's eye lasers, I believe. Lee is the uh, least flammable among us, so I left him to it. Let's take a closer look at some of the more colorful inhabitants of the Oz-9 bioswamp. Oh, let's not. Unfortunately, the audio from the bioswamp is pretty patchy, so we may not be able to hear everything. Ah, she's lazy editing. The snowy white egret of Earth is a type of heron that develops a cascade of fine plumage during mating season. Unlike their terrestrial cousins, whose diet consists mainly of fish and rodents, the Oz-9 egrets are great savage beasts who have perhaps more in common with their distant pterodactyl relatives than the modern egret. 
With tusks, razor-sharp talons, and wingspans in excess of three meters or nine feet, they hunt in flocks, herding their prey off cliffs or into the swirling pools of the swamp to drown. Good lord, am I reading that right? Tusks? Ooh, at last the good beats. You really are just a bloodthirsty bugger, aren't ya? Aww, merci. Let's watch as this smaller flock chooses its prey. Rooting around in the bog, there's a herd of wild boar that, according to G2's astrolimnologist, Dr. Charles Tuckett, were somehow accidentally introduced into the Oz-9 bioswamp. Instead of choosing the smaller, weaker members of the herd, these egrets like a challenge. They've chosen to go after the herd's matriarch, the largest and fiercest of the group. Oh, I can't watch. Says the captain. <laughs> Having chosen their prey, the egrets begin to circle, lower and lower. Now ah, they're hunting in just about killing, eating. Dr. Charles Tuckett, G2 astrolimnologist. It's also a chance to show off their hunting prowess to other egrets, because, you know, showing off and all, because what you're seeing is part strategy, it's part mating ritual. And, you know, sometimes a few of them will uh, skip dinner go straight to dessert. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> Feathers in a frenzy, the flock becomes more and more agitated. They swoop, dive, and spiral, banging their venomous tusks together. <sighs> Good grief, this is ridiculous. Venomous? Yet another venomous thing. Goodness, we really are in Oz. How delightful. Yeah, that tusk business they're doing there, it's part of the mating dance, as far as we can tell. I don't know, I ain't getting close. Intent on driving their chosen target into the swamp to drown, or perhaps into the bog to get stuck in the quicksand. There's quicksand in there! And some mud pots. Stuff bubbles up to the surface from time to time. Found a couple of nice shirts in there. Oh, I don't want to see these parts. Poor piggy. Oh, 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 perhaps we can make BLTs, ball lettuce, and tomato. You know, I think this is happening now. Having melded into a giant swarm acting with a single mind, a single purpose, the egrets are unstoppable. The massive sow has been separated from her herd and is desperately searching for cover. But you know, it's all instinct and prey drive now. Them egrets, it's formidable. But don't count out that sow there. It's, uh, there's a reason that, that, that she's in charge, that she's the big boss here. A strange rustling in the nearby foliage catches her attention. Could this be the help she so urgently needs? Speaking of the foliage, we had the chance to talk with botanist Dr. Ben Marshall about the plant life that was chosen to journey to a new planet aboard the Oz-9. No. Oh. Uh, oh crap! I didn't know about this. <laughs> ben doesn't even know an oxalis triangular is from an oak tree. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, <laughs> oxalis. <laughs> Nerd humor. Can you be more specific, Doctor Marshall? Why exactly did you land on this combination of flora? We uh, wanted symbiosis, also spontaneous. Foliation. That's the technical term for a really thick cover of leaves to protect against solar radiation and um, give the critters uh, something to hide under. Foliation. Genius. Your husband isn't very clever, is he? Hey, he's just not a botanist. Foliation. Or very good under pressure. Well, he is a very handsome fellow, your husband. Ugh, needs a mustache, though. No! Did I mention that this is actually happening right now in the bioswamp? Anybody? Thank you for your input, Dr. Marshall. Clearly, you have a bright future as a public speaker. Okay. Oh, good snark. What is in them bushes? The egrets are now in attack formation, wingtip to wingtip, 
surely the most terrifying sight in the swamp. And what the f is that? Something has just come crashing out of the bog. The egrets have reversed their attack formation and are scrambling to stay out of reach. And the boar is running for her very life back towards her herd. It's all tail and teeth. And what is that thing? Well, I'll be damned. Fred Albert made it. Damn. Looks like I owe Jimmy 20 bucks. I can't believe it. You put an alligator aboard a spaceship on purpose. That there? That's Fat Albert. We scooped him up from my cousin's outdoor bathtub, stuck him on board as a joke. <laughs> yeah, you weren't no bigger than Tap Holman. Wow, Ooh, look at him now. <laughs> hey, don't look at me like that. No one thought he'd survive the launch, much less turn into that monster there. Ooh. Oh boy. Um, how fast is that thing growing? Exponentially. It's a good thing we have the mold to keep it calm. The wild boar is running flat out, as quick as she can go. But that alligator is amazingly fast. Capable of bursts in speed reaching 30 miles an hour on dry land. Hey, uh, look. Albert there's clocking in excess of 60 MPH. What? what? Of a... Hang on, there's a human in there. At, at least I think it's human. All I can see is chest. Can we pull back the camera a bit? A bit more. Pete, get out of there. Nope, I still see just chest. Pull all the way back, Jim. That's it. It appears that a member of the Oz 9's crew number seven. Seven? Uh... IT specialist Leet Hacks. Oh, that's Hex X X, idiot. I know, I'm just trying to minimize confusion. Is standing between the massive alligator and its plump and juicy target. Aw, now I really want a Bert LT. The alligator has slowed, uncertain of this new player on the field. Is it a threat? Or just the promise of a much, much bigger meal? It opens its mouth to take in the scent of this new and unfamiliar element. Lucky bastard. Meat does smell yummy. Why is it swaying back and forth like that, Doctor? Oh, 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 uh, that, that, that's as new, I hadn't seen that. Well, oh, look, clearly it's an attempt to hypnotize the fellow so that Albert can either take him down or get around him. Yeah, that sounds good. Oh, he's crouching. That ain't good. The alligator has now assumed a standard readiness pose, signaling his intention to strike. Mr. Hax isn't moving, though. It's becoming a battle of wills. Who will blink first? <laughs> You're joking. That beast weighs easily three quarters of a ton, probably more than that. <laughs> blink, you idiot. Blink! Oi! Who's he calling an idiot? I'd say the, uh guy trying to stare down a 1,500-pound alligator to save a wild pig. Mm, fair point. The alligator has lowered its immense tail, shifting the weight to its back legs in preparation to lunge. We've already seen what this monster can do. Does this idiot... I'm sorry. Does this man stand a chance? Nope. The alligator opens its mouth, readying that powerful jaw to crush the man's head or snap his neck, with a bite strength of over 2,000 pounds per square inch. Even if he were made of literal steel, he wouldn't be able to withstand the pressure of those ferocious teeth. He lunges. Oh, oh my that? god. What the hell? Oh, oh, Get out of the way. Oh. Holy oh, cow. Oh, 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 my god. Watch it. I think I'll be staying out of the swamp for a little while. Okay, now, what the hell was that? What, was that a laser beam? It just glanced off that alligator's scales. Scutes, not scales. <laughs> scales. Is this really the time? There's always time for accuracy. Good for you, Dr. Charles. But boy, Albert did not like that. He's heading back for the underbrush in a hurry, and the boar is nowhere to be seen. But what fired the shot? It looked like a human being, flying. Surely that's impossible. Dr. Marshall, your thoughts? Oh yeah, that's a drone. We put drones on the Oz-9 so we could have some control in the bio swamp. I guess someone on the ship thought it'd be funny to dress it up like a person. 
I'm actually controlling it from my phone. Watch this. Nothing happened. Still nothing. Nothing. Are you sure you're controlling the lasers? Dude, do you know how far away that ship is? Give it a minute. Pauline, follow your lasers, please. Quickly. Doesn't really matter where, just not at least. There, uh, see? Totally me. Not some human with mysterious superpowers. That's my boy. Well, that is a relief. That's all we have time for. Please join us again next week when Narrator 2... Woohoo! Narrator 2. That's me. ...gets to narrate an utterly sensible documentary on the defense mechanisms of Coral. <sighs> Bastard. Well, there it was. My great opportunity to impress the heads at BBC. And what was I documenting? Idiots in a swamp. Swamp idiots. Well, if you enjoyed this, please feel free to review it. Maybe someone at the BBC will see it. Someday. You've been listening to Bonnie Brantley as Jesse, Eric Perry as Joe, Aaron Clark as Labishan Frise and Ben, David S. Deer as Dr. Theo Brome and Dr. Charles Tuckett, June Clark Eubanks as the Albatross, Kevin Hall as Greg, Erie Alexander as Julie, Shannon Perry as Olivia and Madeline, Raymond Morse as Raymond, Jordash Richardson as No Pants Guy, Kyle Jones as Narrator 2, and me, Richard Nadalny, as your narrator. Our music is composed and performed by John Faley. Our artwork is by Lucas Elliott. Oz 9 is written and produced by Shannon Perry. Thanks for hanging with us through our between-season hiatus. If you'd like to support the show and earn our everlasting gratitude, you can find us at patreon.com slash oz9podcast, all one word. We have some fun goodies to share, including an upcoming by invitation only live read through on Zoom. Season 3 starts July 19th. Till next time, Space Monkeys, narrator out. <laughs>